A note to listeners, the following podcast contains material that may not be appropriate for all audiences. Previously on Father Wants Us Dead. This guy ripped off his mother, killed his wife, killed his three beautiful children in the prime of their lives and just left them there with the music on. Son of a bitch needs to be caught. This went out to millions and millions of households across the United States. If somebody has seen List, if somebody knows List, there's going to be a connection. Please be kind of skeptical because I guess they get a lot of phone calls. And I told them, well, you can either look into it or don't believe me. I said, but it is the guy. I'm Jessica Remo. And I'm Rebecca Everett. And this is Father Wants Us Dead, a podcast about the John List murders from NJ.com and the Star Ledger. In our last episode, we heard about how some determined detectives got this hot new show, America's Most Wanted, to feature John List. The show was taking a chance because List had vanished after killing his entire family 18 years earlier. And no one knew what he looked like anymore. But hey, Jess, no risk, no reward. That's right, Rebecca. And despite the excitement the night the episode aired, the next day, there was no big payoff. And there was nothing the day after that, or even a week later. Authorities had run down over 200 tips, but List was still at large. And while we can't know for sure, it seems like John List probably felt pretty good at this point. He told a psychiatrist later that he had caught the tail end of America's Most Wanted and knew he might be recognized. But he decided not to run. He was just going to wait and see what happened. Right, so every day that goes by after that episode, John List is probably feeling more and more hopeful that he'll get away. Again. And at the same time, back in New Jersey, the cops are just trying to be optimistic. You know, since there's still a chance. But how much hope can you really have left after 18 years of coming up short? They've shot their shot. They got John List's story on national television, where it was seen by 22 million people. What else can they do? But on the 11th day after the episode, June 1st, 1989, everything changed. It was just another Thursday morning for Kevin August and Randy Nidecker, two members of the FBI's Fugitive Task Force in the Richmond, Virginia office. The two agents, both in their 30s, were heading out that day with a list of addresses to check for potential fugitives. It was a pretty routine task. Hi, my name is Rebecca Everett, and I'm a reporter with the Star-Ledger newspaper in New Jersey. I'm looking for Randy. Uh, This is Randy. Did you used to work with the FBI and have anything to do with the arrest of John List? Uh, Yes, I did. One of the tips that Randy and his partner were investigating that day had been passed along from America's Most Wanted. Kevin August said that following up on tips like this, most of the time, you don't turn up anything. So he wasn't especially optimistic when they parked on a cul-de-sac and walked up to the front porch. The woman who answered the door looked surprised. She confirmed that she was Dolores Clark and her husband was Robert P. Clark. The agents told her they were following up on a tip and needed to see some photos just to confirm her husband wasn't the fugitive they were after. Inside, she showed them two photos. One was their wedding photo. And I said to August, look, that looks like the wanted poster. It was like they took their wedding poster and used it as his wanted poster. That's right. This tip about Robert P. Clark, the one that seemed so mundane when the agents started their day with a drive to Midlothian, it's starting to look like a good one. It's starting to look like the one. Here's August. When I saw the picture of him, I started to think, oh my God, I think this is John List. But I didn't let on to her that I thought it was. He was also thinking of that bust that was on America's Most Wanted, the one the forensic sculptor carefully created for the show to look like an aged John List. The bust that was so detailed, it even showed the scar behind his right ear. 
And the picture that she showed me of Robert P. Clark, it was just unbelievable how close the resemblance was. Oh my God, Jess, can you imagine how crazy this moment is? I mean, Dolores is just standing there and these FBI agents are trying not to give themselves away. So August tells her he doesn't think it's the same guy, but he asks for her husband's office address. He says he's just going to go have a quick, casual chat with Robert Clark to confirm. So Randy Nidecker stayed with her to make sure she didn't call her husband and tip him off. He said it was crystal clear. She had no idea about List's true identity. She was total disbelief. You know, it's the most uncomfortable time I've ever spent in a room with a woman, I'll tell you that. And I can understand why. She still, I thought, didn't accept it, who she was living with. In the meantime, August is rushing to find a payphone to call for backup. The agents meet him, and they walk into the accounting office. They barely start talking to the receptionist when they see the face from the wanted poster walking down the hall toward them with a bunch of papers in his hands. You know, I had one of the take the paper from him. I had him put his hands on the wall, spread his legs. I asked him about the scars. And Um, so he didn't really seem upset like you might expect someone to be if they were, if it really was a case of mistaken identity. He was a strange man. I would say uh, he was not very animated. That's the best way to put it. He seemed to me as a vessel with no soul in there. There was no soul in that body. You're not the first person who's told me that. Really? That they looked in his eyes and just said, there's no soul in there. But I can tell you, I arrested a lot of people in my career in law enforcement. I was a police officer before I was an FBI agent. But this man, if you looked into his eyes, I'm telling you there was nothing there. Imagine this scene, Rebecca. The agent's adrenaline must be soaring. This could be the catch of a lifetime. And here's John List, barely even reacting. Because in any crime show or movie, this is a big scene, right? The fugitive either fights back and screams, you've got the wrong guy, or he breaks down and just confesses everything. But John List is stoic to the end. He's insisting he's Robert Clark, but he isn't even really protesting that much. And it doesn't matter what he says because the agents can see that mastoidectomy scar by his ear. They cuff him and then confirm his hernia scars too. At this point, it's pretty clear. John List, a mass murderer and fugitive for 18 years, is finally in custody. And that's what this episode is about. The moment he goes from the spine-chilling boogeyman of Westfield, out there somewhere, to an old man in handcuffs, finally facing justice. And across the country, the news sent shockwaves from his completely blindsided second wife, to the town of Westfield, to the cops who had chased him for nearly two decades. And their fight wasn't over yet, not by a long shot. But at this point, the FBI agents are putting List in the backseat of a cruiser, and it's a good moment. As they drive away, August can't resist trying one more time to get List to admit who he is. I remember asking him, I said, what kind of man are you that you killed your mother, your wife, and your children? And then assume another identity and marry another woman who has no idea who you are. He just stared, and I was looking at him through the rearview mirror, and I saw a little tear come down his right eye. And that was it. It was like one tear, and that was it. But he never admitted to me that he was... He was John List. And because this is such a critical moment in the John List case, one we've been trying to imagine in our minds, we wanted to see the accounting office for ourselves. And so we went when we were in Richmond in June. Okay, so we're walking into the accounting office, or what was the accounting office that is now some sort of arthritis center? Yeah, the uh, office building 
no longer contains that accounting office, but this would have been right where the FBI agents walked in when they went to arrest John List, you know, went up to the second floor where his office is. It's a nondescript office building, brick with big windows. And in the hall outside that office, what looks like it could have been the same carpet that was there when John List got arrested in 1989. Oh, man. Yeah. All right. So this is it. Suite 207, which is now the Arthritis Foundation. It looks really empty. And it looks totally empty. It looks like they have vacated completely. There's a little note on the door. Effective immediately, our team will be working remotely. That now empty office in Richmond was the end of the road for Robert P. Clark. Now, Rebecca, the fun part. Authorities in Richmond get on the phone to their counterparts in New Jersey to deliver the news they've been waiting 18 years to hear. John List is captured. And this is 1989. So the fax machine is excruciatingly slow, printing out the images of his fingerprints. But when they finally come through, there is no doubt. They have their man. Talking to these sources about what this moment was like, God, Rebecca, this was the best. It gave me goosebumps because it's an overwhelmingly sad story, of course. But this is that one big moment of triumph. It's the pivotal moment when John List stops being some mythical nemesis. If you're a cop or a loved one or just a neighbor, you hear this news and realize that justice is finally coming. Here's Barney Tracy, the Westfield detective who's been chasing List for more than a decade. I received a call from the Newark FBI, and they told me, like, we got him. And I went, you got who? <laughs> you know, I was like, we got John List. And I, I mean, I was totally shocked. And, uh, you know, my family thought I was crazy. And they're like, what, what do you got, you know? But it was like hitting a lottery for me. It was like, for that guy. He calls up the retired police chief, James Moran, the one who felt so personally responsible for the case that he carried the wanted poster in his shirt pocket every day since 1971. I called Chief Moran. And at the time, he couldn't even, he put his wife on the phone. It's the first time in my life I've seen my husband speechless. <laughs> so I was like, wow. And, you know, it was just, that was so great for him because everything had been put on him, I think, through the years. In the prosecutor's office, Jeffrey Paul Hummel said he had to have the news repeated a few times before he could really believe it. And then, of course, I, I called my wife, and um, I told her, I says it worked. I said, they got him. And it went from there. And all our friends and our relatives, and we, we reached out and we, we let them know. And then, of course, by the evening, it was all over the national news. And that's how the news spreads at first in Westfield. People calling people, shouting it out at work, or even to strangers on the street. It was jubilant. The police chief at the time, Anthony Scuddy, said if there was a big microphone over the town you would have heard a giant sigh of relief. But for people like Susan Cousins Jankowitz, who still lived with the loss, the news also brought all that pain back to the forefront. After that, there was just, I guess, a bit of an obsession. It was like, what do I do? I mean, I was working, but my thought process was, you know, damn you, I'm going to show up in court every day. You're going to face me. Like, you know what I mean? I just was amazed that he remarried. I was blown away that he was so cogent in his plan to do it. Because there's that whole other level of unbelievability here, that this killer had created this new, fairly normal domestic life. That's what Helen's sister and brother-in-law, the Seiferts, were so amazed by. Here's their son, Tim Seifert. Being amazed that, you know, he took someone else's identity and then started a new life and tried to pawn himself off as somebody else to his wife. Tim Seifert even wrote letters to his Uncle John, asking him to explain why he did what he did. And List replied, acknowledging he was his uncle and remembered him. But weirdly, 
he still signed his letters Robert P. Clark. And of course, he never answered that big question. So, I mean, I was just curious as to what would go through someone's head to want to do that and feel good about it to stay alive. You know, most people probably would have taken their own life or felt remorse and turned themselves in, but certainly not him. But someone did turn John List in. An unlikely hero ending the killer's long flight from justice from her living room couch. We'll tell you the whole story after the break. As the news about List's capture broke all over the country, journalists in New Jersey were scrambling. It was one of the biggest crime stories here since the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby. The Star Ledger sent reporters to Richmond and Denver, trying to learn everything they could about John List's astonishing second life. This is something that, as reporters, we're always doing after a big story breaks. Door knocking. Ideally, you want to talk to family and friends. But sometimes, you're just trying any neighbor, hoping they know something. Usually, they don't. We used to have the joke in the office that when someone was going out on a murder, it would be, well, don't forget to ask the neighbors what a nice guy he was. This is Gabe Gluck, the Star-Ledger reporter who finds himself in Aurora, Colorado, the day after the story breaks. And you have to remember, at this point, no one knows who called in the tip about John List. So Gabe has no idea. He's about to stumble upon that tipster in the condo next to Bob and Dolores' old place. I just started knocking on doors and do you know, and... Wanda answers the door, couldn't be more gracious, come in, sit down, and then she proceeds to tell me the story about how she had called the FBI to tell them about how they were in Midlothian, Virginia. Of course, you can just feel the thrill for Gabe to have this scoop, to have just happened upon Wanda Flannery, Dolores' old friend who turned in John List. But there's another coincidence here. And it's a twist that no one saw coming. But it wasn't the first time that she thought that he was John List. That's right. Wanda Flannery had read a story about List and thought she recognized him in a supermarket tabloid a few years earlier. But we have to backtrack even further here to tell you that story. You'll remember we talked about how Gabe had written a 15th anniversary story about the List murders back in 1986. And he said nothing came of it. No leads for police. Crickets. A month or so later, I get a phone call from a guy in Florida who says he's the editor of a weekly paper down there and he'd like to use some of my story. And then a couple of weeks later, I'm standing in line to check out at the Pathmark in Garwood and I'm looking at all the the Inquirer and that kind of thing, you know, alien abductions. And there is the World Weekly News. There on the front page is John List. Son of a bitch. That's where the story went. So Gabe doesn't love having his story retold in a trashy tabloid that also has alien abductions in it. But you know who loves those tabloids? Wanda Flannery. And when Gabe meets her in June of 1989, she tells him she read about John List a few years earlier in the Weekly World News. Wanda tells Gabe she even showed the story to Dolores back then. But Dolores said there was no way it could be Bob. This is all pre-internet where anybody can see anything and read up on anything anywhere in the world. I mean, it it was just the coincidence of the paper. I mean, her apartment was filled with all these tabloids. She was a real junkie for that. So that story could have caught List a few years earlier if Wanda and Dolores had taken it more seriously. But Wanda told Gabe that after Dolores dismissed it, she basically forgot about it. Until she was watching America's Most Wanted with her daughter, Eva, and son-in-law, Randy Mitchell, a few years later. Randy said Wanda was sure her former neighbor was this killer, John List, from New Jersey. But she was scared to call it in, afraid he might come after her if he wasn't caught. So Randy made the call for her. He calls 20 minutes after the show ends, 
tells them John List is now calling himself Robert P. Clark and gives them the Clark's address. Wanda had it from a letter Dolores had written her. I think she was more afraid, too, for Dolores. Maybe something happened to Dolores. I think that's really what was worrying her the most. Right, well, and it must be sort of conflicted because you want to do it to protect Dolores, but at the same time, you're turning in your friend's husband. Yeah, I think it ended their friendship. I think Dolores got kind of bitter because she loved him. I asked Gabe Gluck how Wanda felt about being the one to crack this true crime story wide open. Now she's being interviewed and having her photo in all the papers. She was tickled pink. (laughs) She was tickled. I mean, you know, her cocktail table was filled with all these magazines. I mean, this is the stuff she loved to read. So the idea that she had now moved from observer to participant, that she was the one who dropped the dime on one of the most incredible murderers in the history of American crime, I mean, that could almost go on your gravestone. This is another moment, Jess, when it's like you said, it's just awesome to hear these stories and see who these people are who brought down this man. You can just feel how excited Gabe is to retell it after all these years. And this is such a big scoop as a reporter. How great is that moment when you call your editor and say you found the person who turned in John List? Right, and you can't believe this second life he's lived while Westfield was still haunted by him. And then, after this lady's call, he's finally caught and locked up. To learn what those first days after the arrest were like, we talked to David Baugh. He's a well-known criminal attorney in Richmond, now semi-retired, and back in 1989, he ended up representing List in court. Yeah, sorry, just, I'm Rebecca, I'm this is Jessica. I'm host here. <laughs> yeah, Rebecca, nice to meet you. Yeah, in person. I don't remember people, but I do remember cases. That's good. <laughs> he took the case as a favor to another attorney, thinking it would be simple. List was arrested on a fugitive warrant which usually just means a quick hearing to make sure it's the right guy, and then you get sent back to wherever you're wanted for a crime. But since List was still maintaining that he was Robert Clark, this wouldn't be that simple. But Ba didn't know this. He only realized he was in for a circus when he saw all the news vans at the courthouse. And I said, what's going on? Oh, they arrested some guy from New Jersey who's been missing for like 17 years. I went, should have charged more money. This is getting complicated. So I went upstairs, I met him, and he was kind of weird. He was really kind of dull. He didn't have much personality. He wasn't very animated. It was just, um, yeah, matter of fact almost. So instead of the usual quick fugitive hearing, because List is still claiming to be Bob Clark, they plead the fifth and refused to admit he's John List. Basically, Ba said he bought himself some time to figure out how to best help his client. And John List, after 18 years of freedom, is sent to a small, cold cell in the county jail. He wrote that he was given a paper-thin gown to wear and that he curled up in the fetal position as the shock of his situation sunk in. This was his life now, a cell. But while John List is worried about himself, his wife, this unsuspecting woman he tricked, is just coming to terms with reality. And here she is, sitting in her living room with an FBI agent while her husband is confirmed to be a fugitive killer. How do you even begin to process that? What are the questions you're asking yourself? What are the questions you want to ask your husband? After the break, we talk more about what it's like to learn you're married to a murderer. So, Rebecca, I know you've known your husband for 12 years or so, but maybe you've experienced this thing where you only belatedly find out something about your partner and you're like, how did I not know this? I knew we were going to talk about this, but I was thinking and the only thing I could come up with was that I just learned he's never seen Fight Club. Okay, well, that is crazy, but not divorce worthy. Still, you get it. When you're together a long time, you just assume you know everything about each other. 
but that's not always the case. And sometimes it's more than just something little. Right. We've all heard stories about people keeping secrets in their marriages or even leading double lives. But in this case, in the case of John List and Dolores, this is a level of spousal deceit that's in its own realm. And you might think, surely the wife must have known something. But there's overwhelming evidence that Dolores had no clue at all about her husband's true identity. She believed him that his first wife died of cancer and didn't pry when he seemed to have no family ties. She just thought her doting husband was an accountant who sometimes struggled to find work and pay the bills, but a murderer? It must have been surreal. I feel so bad for her, Jess. And we know Dolores doesn't have many close friends in Richmond. She's only been there about a year. So when she learned what happened, she called up one of her husband's good friends, his former landlord, Wally Parsons. We heard from his son, Jeff. He remembers seeing Dolores at his dad's house the next day. So I'm, you know, I'm going to a college downtown and come over to visit and there's a lady sitting on a couch crying. But I didn't recognize the person. And it's kind of like, you know, what the heck's going on? And my dad said something to the fact that, hey, hold on, take a look at this. And he hands me a newspaper and it's got a picture of John List on the front of it, or Robert Clark as we knew it. So that woman was his wife. She obviously was devastated because she knew this person as Robert Clark and been living a lie the whole time. You know, if you put yourself in her shoes, oh my gosh, it's got to be horrifying. Absolutely horrifying. Also processing this crazy news was Reverend Joseph Vogt. He had only just started to get to know Bob and Dolores after they joined his parish in Richmond. I'm sure you're used to ministering to people in a lot of difficult situations, but trying to help a a couple through something like this must be really challenging. Well, it yeah, <laughs> never imagined. But then we're led to places we never imagined going in ministry and in life. I went to visit him in the Henrico County Jail, and I reached out to Dolores first, of course. We had conversation, and she was stunned. Beyond that she was stunned, how was she reacting to the news? I think that's probably the best word. Yeah. Just, yeah, stunned and heartsick. And this heartsick woman is now going with her pastor to the jail to visit this man who's lied to her for a dozen years. And as we learned, this meeting actually ends up being very important. To explain why, you should know that John List kept maintaining that he was Robert Clark for months. Even after the fingerprints, even after he was shipped to New Jersey to prepare for trial, he said he was Bob Clark and he was innocent. So authorities were preparing to prove his identity in court. But we got a police statement that actually shows that he confessed to Dolores within two days of his arrest. He was on suicide watch the deputy sheriff monitoring him overheard List speaking to Dolores on a telephone through a glass partition. That rookie deputy, David Vital, told investigators List was kind of emotional at times in this hour-long conversation with his wife. Vital could hear in his voice that List was crying as he spoke about his children. He said List was actually sobbing a little when he said this. I was always such a kind, gentle man, except for that one act. Jess, it really was shocking to read this report, not just because List was being fully honest with Dolores, but because he was emotional, and we know that's rare for him. I mean, we're seven episodes into this podcast, and this is the first hint of him being at all upset about what he did. But those emotions only last a moment. And then, in keeping with his obsessive-compulsive personality disorder, List is steering their conversation to money, numbers, loose ends that he needs tied up. He talks to Dolores about the bills and encourages her to sell her story to the tabloids. He says he's going to tell her where it all started to fall apart. 
And he talks about meeting his first wife and their struggles, including Helen's drinking and then her drug use. How the house in Westfield cost $50,000 and his savings just didn't last. And interesting that according to this deputy, List never mentioned anything about God or the children's souls or all those things he talked about in the confession letter. It was mostly about Helen and money. It certainly supports the idea that that's why he really did what he did and that the stuff about them going to heaven as Christians was just rationalizing. Reverend Vogt said what struck him when he met Bob Clark in his cell was how concerned he was for his wife, Dolores. And Vogt was too. As her pastor, he wants to help her through this. But what do you say to someone who's just been told her husband is a liar and a murderer? He said the church congregation really wrapped its arms around Dolores and tried to support her, which was honestly a comfort to hear. One of the biggest problems was the media following her everywhere. One time she was run off the road by reporters trying to get a photo of her. They were hounding her. And so there was a point at which uh, we kind of gave her sanctuary in our home. And they didn't know how to get hold of her. We determined very quickly as a parish that we were going to care for her and do what we could to uh, keep her away from the insanity of a rabid press. List's attorney, David Baugh, also got a peek at their relationship at this point. And it seemed like Dolores wasn't even processing what was going on. Instead of dealing with the matter at hand, she and List just exchanged historical books, with List underlining and making notes about the most important things for his wife to read. She was in over her head, and she was kind of brittle, um psychologically, and it, it, I mean, this was killing her. This was burying her. So yeah, I, that's the reason I agreed to give the press conference. So the press conference. About a week after List's arrest, Dolores is still getting harangued by reporters. So Ba hopes if she speaks to the press for a few minutes, they'll leave her alone. At the press conference, despite what List had confessed to her in jail a week earlier... She told reporters she didn't believe it. She said, I love my husband very deeply. I do not believe this is the same man. Yeah, I mean, this is strange, but I don't want to judge her too harshly. After what she went through, maybe she truly could not believe it, even after he confessed. Or maybe she thought saying that would just get the reporters off her back. Who knows, Jess? We can't really know what that whole time was like for her, even though we really want to. Because Dolores has always stayed silent about what she went through. She hasn't participated in any of the TV specials or done interviews with reporters. But we still wanted to try. And while we knew there was a good chance she wouldn't want to talk to us, as reporters, we can't just assume that. It's Journalism 101. It's only fair to give her the chance to tell her own story. It took some digging, but we found her. She's changed her name and over the years lived in two different states, though we're not going to say where. We sent her a letter at her new address and ultimately decided to knock on her door to see if she would talk to us and tell us what it was like from her point of view. Rebecca, I haven't been that anxious to knock on someone's door in years. Yeah, like the stakes are high, but more than that, and it might sound silly, but I just didn't want her to be mad at us or upset at all. Right. We even had to give ourselves a pep talk in the parking lot with Andre Malloch, our videographer, who came in case she was willing to do an interview. What's our strategy here? What What are we doing? She's been through it with the press when it happened she was very hounded by the media and trying to process what happened to her and stuff so she may not want to talk to us but we're hoping that she will if she says get the hell out of here we'll get the hell out of here she'd be within her right, we'll her go, do rights to we'll say that quietly. to us and we will uh, respect her and leave okay you ready yeah it was a nice enough place an apartment complex with 120 units 
pretty landscaping, quiet. Her apartment was on the third floor, so we headed up this external staircase. Man, I don't usually get this nervous about this stuff, but my heart is beating fast. It's the fact that we drove five hours. I don't think that helps. Doorbell looks sort of broken, though. As we approached, I noticed she had this poinsettia outside her door, still thriving in June. We rang the bell and could hear someone moving inside. And then, all of a sudden, the door swung open. She's in her 80s. Her hair is gray, white at the temples. She's wearing large glasses and a yellow t-shirt. After all these months reporting, Jess, it was overwhelming to be facing John List's only survivor. Hello, Dolores. Hi, I'm Jessica. This is Rebecca. We're um, the reporters from New Jersey that sent you a letter forever ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Well... We tried. She was sweet about it. Yep, she sent us packing with a smile and a sassy goodbye, ladies. And obviously we were disappointed. But do we sympathize with her? Of course. Because we've talked so much in this podcast about how the John List story is about not really knowing the person you're closest to, the person you share your life with. And Dolores is the one who really had to reckon with that. And who could blame her after going through that for not trusting us, total strangers? And maybe Dolores just realized early on that it wasn't worth it for her to tell her side of the story, with so much already published about her, when she was this unwilling participant in List deception. Whatever the reason, a lot about Dolores, how she persevered through it all and came out the other side, is still a mystery. We do know that she worked in cosmetology for a while. It's been reported that they got divorced, but we weren't able to find any records of divorce or annulment. And can you even legally get divorced when you marry a fictitious person with an assumed identity? This was actually a concern of hers, according to Jerome Kendall, who we heard from in episode five. He went to the same church as Bob and Dolores and said he felt compelled to write to Bob Clark in jail, to offer him a kind word. He also tried to support Dolores. She um, called every so often just to check in and... uh, She talked a little bit about Bob, but not a great deal. I think she was embarrassed about the whole thing. Uh, Plus, she she didn't really know what her status was. She was afraid that uh, she was, in fact, married to uh, someone who was already married or still married under the law or what have you. And there was this one other question that I posed to almost everyone I talked to because I just couldn't stop thinking about it. Was Dolores ever in danger? Being married to this cold-blooded killer, would John List have killed again? I mean, he didn't have all the same stressors, but he said he was worried about losing his job. And Dolores told her friend Wanda that he just kept spending money they didn't have. So it's possible that he would have gone broke again. And we know how John List feels about going broke. Wouldn't he start looking for a way out again? But David Baugh, List's first attorney after his arrest, said he doesn't think List would have killed again. It's what he's seen over decades of defending alleged murderers. Most killers don't kill again. Murderers have the lowest rate of recidivism of all of the criminals. I've done a lot of murder cases. And Stephen Simring, the psychiatrist who interviewed List about a year after his capture, agrees. Well, my answer is anything's possible. Highly, highly unlikely. When you look at crimes like this, a familicide, basically killing your family, multiple members of your family, these crimes do not repeat themselves. And they're terrible, but they're one-offs. And uh, this is a guy who uh, would have been the safest person in the world to have as a neighbor. Most of the law enforcement members we talked to weren't so sure that List wouldn't resort to violence again. I mean, he'd already shown what he was capable of. 
And that's what John Walsh of America's Most Wanted told me. He believes Liss capture may have saved Dolores' life. When you cross the uncrossable line and you kill, and you kill three of your own children, you don't you think he's going to stop and go get found by Jesus? No, he's a, he, he was, it, it only takes a couple things to snap. If they financially got in trouble and she didn't have any money, she'd be the next one. But thankfully, we never got to find out whether List would have killed another loved one because he never got the chance. Here's Jeffrey Paul Hummel. Next question yeah. to you. Do you think he, might, he could have done this again? Well, you know what? And again, I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't know. But the signs showed Liz was falling into the same pattern. He had professional failures. He was being boxed into the same problems he had that led him to eliminate his first family. So is it possible? Certainly. I don't know. But thank God it didn't materialize because... He was uh, placed under arrest and held accountable for what he did back in 1971. And that's thanks to these cops who refused to give up. And this fledgling TV program that subsequently took off. And of course, this little old lady, Wanda Flannery, who loved the tabloids and crime shows. And what's really hard to shake about this whole thing, Rebecca, is that this capture almost didn't happen. So many stars had to align to finally bring John List to justice. Because without America's Most Wanted, he had never been brought in. I think he would have died of old age and never been apprehended and held accountable for those horrific deeds. Was there a celebration? Was there a... No, not really. It was just a felt of elation that this person had been caught, and that's what counted. So, uh, no, I didn't participate in any real celebration, and I don't think anybody else really did at that point. We just did our jobs. And that was to get Liz back in New Jersey and prosecute him. Because it's not over yet. They have to get List back to New Jersey. But David Baugh is a good attorney, and he's not making it easy on them. It's weeks before he makes a deal with a prosecutor, and List agrees to be extradited. Which means it's time for John List to finally stand trial for his crimes— nearly two decades after he committed them. You might think his goose was cooked with a confession note and the mountains of evidence against him. But this is John List. And while he may be a coward and completely without remorse, he's also incredibly stubborn and righteous. And with another good attorney by his side, He mounts a defense that asks jurors the question that all of us are still asking ourselves. Could anyone in their right mind have done this? Can you send someone to jail forever if they weren't in their right mind? That's the next big question, as the John List saga finally makes its way back to New Jersey. We'll take you there in our next episode. It was just like a, like it was like a cold wind in the courtroom. I mean, he wasn't like wild eyed or anything. He was just so calm. He was just creepy, like a, like a psychopath. The assignment judge gave me the case to try and John List and I, unfortunately, will be forever entwined. I hope he's not in my obituary, but uh, he might be. Uh, this was not a battle of the experts in a classical sense. I think there was probably a (gasps) from the crowd, but there was no visible reaction from him. None at all. Father Wants Us Dead is a production of NJ Advance Media. It's reported, written, and produced by us, Jessica Remo and Rebecca Everett. Christopher Kelly is our executive producer and director. Alyssa Pasagio and Kevin Whitmer are also executive producers. Father Wants Us Dead was recorded at Sound on Sound Studios in Montclair, New Jersey. Our sound designer, mixer, and editor is Jacob Stone. Jacob and Alex Ritchie composed the music, and Alex also helped mix the podcast. James Shapiro is our associate audio engineer with help from Natalie Patterson. Additional audio was provided by Adam Kolick and Andre Malak. Our website was designed by Allah Salim. 
Special thanks to all our sources who agreed to talk to us, even though we know it wasn't easy. You can visit fatherwantsusdead.com for more about the story, including crime scene photos and other extras we couldn't fit into the show. And you can email us at inbox at fatherwantsusdead.com. Subscribe to Father Wants Us Dead wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're enjoying it, please rate and review it and help us spread the word.